You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Heart Matters, where leading cardiology experts explore the latest trends, technologies, and clinical developments in cardiology practice. Heart Matters is produced in cooperation with the American College of Cardiology. Your host is Dr. Janet Wright, Senior Vice President for Science and Quality for the American College of Cardiology. What anticoagulation therapies are best for patients with atrial fibrillation, those patients at risk for stroke? Our guest today is Dr. Stuart Connolly, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Division of Cardiology and the Salim Yusuf Chair in Cardiology at McMaster University in Ontario. Welcome, Dr. Connolly. Hi, how are you? Oh, great, and we are delighted to have you today. I think we might start with your description of the evidence to date about anticoagulation in the presence of atrial fib. Okay, it's pretty well understood that atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke very substantially, and in patients with underlying risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, or prior stroke, uh, the risk is really quite high and that these patients require some form of preventive therapy to reduce the risk of stroke. There's two preventive therapies that are recognized, one which works very well and one which is only modest. The one that works very well is vitamin K antagonist therapy, which in North America means warfarin. And the one that doesn't work so well but is used in low-risk patients is aspirin. And I think you mentioned those risk factors that elevate a person's risk of stroke but differentiates the low and high risk. Maybe you'd emphasize those once more. Sure. It's very widely accepted that every patient with atrial fibrillation should be considered for preventive therapy against stroke. And the first step in doing that is to assess the risk of the patient because not all patients have the same risk. There's a variety of different risk factors that are recognized, and these are now almost always thought of according to a very popular score called the CHAD-2 score. CHAD stands for C is for congestive heart failure, H is for hypertension, A is for age over 75, D is for diabetes mellitus, and S is for stroke or prior stroke or TIA, and S gets two points, so it's called the CHADS two score. So you can add up the number of points a patient has, and it goes from zero to six. There's five items, but one is worth two points. Patients with a CHAD score of zero have quite a low risk of stroke, even when they have atrial fibrillation. Patients with a CHAD score of one are intermediate, and patients with a CHAD score of two or greater are considered to be high risk. Obviously, as the score goes up, the risk goes up quite steadily. That was very helpful. And you mentioned that folks at high risk are treated with vitamin K antagonist warfarin in North America. Warfarin is fraught with some troubles, isn't it? Difficult. Why don't you talk to us about the advantages and the limitations of warfarin use? So warfarin is a drug that most physicians are familiar with and most physicians know that it is a difficult drug. It has a very narrow therapeutic range and it needs ongoing monitoring to be used safely. So if patients are going to be on a vitamin K antagonist, they have to have at least monthly measurements of the international normalized ratio, or the INR as it's called. And we need to keep the INR between two and three. This can be challenging to do. There are patient-related factors which can influence how easy it is to keep a patient in the normal range. And there are physician-related factors. Not everybody uh, knows how to keep patients in the normal range. And for people who are just managing a few patients, it can really be a challenge. There are techniques out there that make it easier for people to do a good job with warfarin. And these are becoming more and more available and widely recognized, but it's still um, a big challenge for many people. You were involved uh, intimately with the randomized evaluation of long-term anticoagulation therapy, or the RELY trial. Would you walk us through the construct of that trial and the outcomes? Sure. So a little bit of background first. The problems with warfarin are very evident, and it's been widely recognized by physicians and indeed the pharmaceutical industry that we need better anticoagulants particularly for patients with atrial fibrillation, but for, for all types of patients that benefit from these treatments. There has been a large development 
program in many companies trying to find these agents, and several have now come to the point where they are being studied in randomized clinical trials. There's two promising classes of these drugs. One class is called factor 10A inhibitors. They block a specific a protein high up in the coagulation cascade called factor 10A. And there are the direct thrombin inhibitors, which block thrombin, the final common pathway for uh, the activation of uh, blood clotting through fibrinogen. Of these two types of agents, the most well-developed is the direct thrombin inhibitor, specifically a drug known as dabigatran, which was developed over the last 10 years and was studied in atrial fibrillation patients in the RELY study published almost exactly a year ago. The RELY study was a large, pivotal, phase 3 randomized clinical trial testing two doses of dabigatran against warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation who had elevated risk for stroke. Most of the patients had a CHAD score of 1 or greater. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Wright. Our guest today is Dr. Stuart Connolly, professor of medicine and director of the Division of Cardiology and the Salim Youssef Chair in Cardiology at McMaster University. We're talking about anticoagulation therapies for atrial fibrillation and specifically now the RELY trial. You described the trial, the use of dabigatran. Talk to us about the findings. Well, the population that you studied, you said, was a high-risk population with atrial fib. Let us hear more about the results of that study. Well, the results of the study were really quite astounding. They were much better than anyone had anticipated. The study was designed to show that at least one of the two doses of dabigatran that were studied were non-inferior to warfarin, which is a somewhat technical way of trying to show that they were at least as good as warfarin. No one expected that these drugs would be better than warfarin. The goal was to find something that was as good as warfarin and easier to use for patients, which would have been a major success. But what actually happened was that the RELY trial showed that dabigatran was actually superior to warfarin in many different ways. It's obviously easier to use. No monitoring is required. But the findings of RELY were really remarkable. The higher dose of dabigatran reduced the risk of stroke compared to warfarin and reduced many types of bleeding. The lower dose of dabigatran had the same risk of stroke as warfarin but had substantially lower bleeding of all types and lower bleeding than the higher dose of dabigatran. Perhaps one other key finding was very pivotal in creating a lot of excitement, and this was that bleeding into the brain, one of the really worrisome things that can happen with warfarin, was dramatically reduced with the bigotran, more than two-thirds reductions with both doses of the bigotran, a highly significant result. So overall, the bigotran turned out to not just be easier to use than warfarin, but clearly superior in both efficacy against stroke and in safety. Stunning and so hopeful for patient care. Can you describe any disadvantages of dabigatran? Well, there were some potential disadvantages for sure. Quite surprisingly, we observed that there was a somewhat higher rate of myocardial infarction in patients receiving dabigatran. Myocardial infarction rates were low because in this uh, type of patient, they were less than 1% per year. And the increase in myocardial infarctions was small, but it does seem to be possibly a real effect, and it certainly raises uh, some concern. Overall, however, the benefits against stroke and intracerebral bleeding clearly vastly outweigh any potential risk of myocardial infarction. The other concern was that even though overall bleeding was reduced, and even though the most worrisome types of bleeding were dramatically reduced, there was a higher rate of gastrointestinal bleeding with dabigatran 150 milligrams twice day, the higher dose. 
still not understood why there should be more uh, GI bleeding with the bigger trend, but it is a real effect and obviously of some concern uh, in patients who would perhaps have had a previous GI bleed, for example. How about an update on the other class of drugs that you described, the factor 10A inhibitors? The Bigotrin is the only direct trauma inhibitor currently in any advanced stage of study, but there are several factor 10A inhibitors that are in phase 3 studies. These are drugs known as apixaban or rivaroxaban or um, edoxaban. These drugs are also showing great promise in a number of different other areas separate from atrial fibrillation, such as deep vein thrombosis treatment and venous thromboembolism prophylaxis after orthopedic surgery. They're also being studied in large phase three trials in atrial fibrillation. Just last week, we presented the results of the Averroes study with apixaban. We studied apixaban in patients who were unsuitable for warfarin and who were currently being treated with aspirin. This study was stopped prematurely when the Data Monitoring Committee repeatedly observed a major benefit in favor of apixaban. The results from the trial showed that apixaban dramatically reduces the risk of stroke, more than a 50% reduction compared to aspirin and also did this without a significant increase in bleeding. So that Pixaban had about the same bleeding risk as aspirin does in these patients. So as with the RELY study, we now have really clear evidence that a Pixaban is going to be vastly superior to aspirin in these patients who can't take warfarin and it's very likely to have important benefits over warfarin. We won't know the clear results compared to warfarin until another study called Aristotle gets reported in about one year's time. But for patients who can't take warfarin, and that's a lot of people in North America, probably close to half the high-risk atrial fibrillation patients are currently not on warfarin, apixaban is going to be a very attractive therapy, extremely well-tolerated, very low risk of bleeding, and very effective against stroke. Exciting news. After trying to manage patients for 23 years in my practice on warfarin, I've seen so many problems with either an overdose or an underdose when everyone around the circle of care is trying to do the best job. So this would be a huge breakthrough, either one of these. Usually at the end of every study, what we know is now what we don't know and usually triggers another set and another cycle. What do you see as the next set of questions to be answered about these drugs? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that, in my opinion, there's enough information and the results are strong enough that these drugs are going to be approved and will come on the market. I think it's likely that the bigger trend will be available within months and Pixaban will likely be available within a year or so. Those are just guesses on my part. I'm not involved in the regulatory aspects of these programs. I think that over the next five years, there's going to be several of these agents, perhaps as many as five or six, each with slightly different profiles, but all of them clearly superior to warfarin in one way or another. I think that in atrial fibrillation, at least, the use of warfarin is going to dramatically decrease as these drugs become accepted and their benefits start to become obvious to the individual practitioner and to the patient's. There are, of course, many questions to answer. You know, there will be questions about, do we have the dose exactly right? There'll be questions about which patients can we treat who have renal dysfunction, for example. Uh, The bigger trend is renally cleared, and it only can be used in patients currently who have at least a minimum level of uh, renal function. There's going to be questions about how do we optimize the care of these patients? How do we ensure that patients take their medications? Lots of important work still to be done. We've been talking with Dr. Stuart Connolly about anticoagulation therapies for atrial fibrillation. Dr. Connolly, thank you for being our guest today. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Heart Matters is produced in cooperation with the American College of Cardiology. For more information on this week's show or to download a podcast of this segment, please visit us at ReachMD.com. Thank you for listening.